So it's recording. There we go. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. And let's go back to chapter 13, verse 1. Paul is introducing a new subject here. Well, it's actually a continuation of it, but he's flowing into something. He's talked about the priority of the gifts, and they had a problem with understanding, misunderstanding the purpose of the gifts. And the gifts were designed to edify the church and, to, and probably for evangelism purposes both. And of course, some gifts even were, I believe, help people to function in the benevolent realm, as we've already seen. So if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, see, now tongue speaking was the cast me out to them, it appears to be. Tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, then I become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal, or a clanging cymbal. <clears throat> so love is the most important. Now, some people talk about love and don't really understand what it is, but True love is going to do whatever God says and toward with respect to God and respect to fellow men, with respect to myself as well. So this gets into it. So he goes into it now. Let's look at verse two. And I don't know who I started with last week, but uh, go ahead, James. Could you could you start it for us? I think we started. Yes, sir. With okay. Kai Aeon Echo, Propheteon, Kai Edo Ta Musteria, Pantap Kai Pasantain Genosin, Kai Aeon Echo Pasantain Pistin Hosta, Ore Mathipanain, Agapain De. Um, may echo Uthen Amy. Uh, and I translated that. Uh, and if I have a prophecy, and I may know every mystery and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove a mountain, but I do not have the love, I am nothing. Okay. Now notice, uh, do not have the love. Don't have love, okay? Now, He's already there. They had a problem. They thought tongue speaking was the greatest, so that's why he dealt with it in verse one. But he turns now in verse two. I think he goes to he is himself uh, said that prophecy was the greatest, uh, the most important, by virtue of what we arguments we made back starting back in chapter twelve, verse twenty-eight, I believe. So. So he, he goes away from that to even his own points. And he's, he's saying, in fact, even if you had this greatest gift, prophecy, but you didn't have love, or it is the other gifts too, but I have no charity in King James. That, that's not a good rendering. Love is the best. So if I had all this, so he now turns even to the gifts that he's shown the priorities. Even if you had it straight that you were seeking and you understood prophecy was the greatest, but you didn't love people. I mean, I've known people that uh, didn't seem to love people, didn't seem to love the lost. <clears throat> I was, I read this in the Bolton article, some it's a made up story, I think, but supposedly this man came and preached a sermon, uh, others. There were preachers that produced sermon books, and sometimes other preachers will get the other preacher's sermon and preach it. And, you know, you can do that, but I don't think you're growing like you ought to. I think we need to prepare our own sermons as much as possible. Uh, but we can use other people's materials, and there's nothing wrong with it. But we need to study it and digest it and understand it if we're going to use other people's outlines. But supposedly this preacher... I was trying out and he had this sermon, he preached it. And then the next week, and they asked this old man in the congregation, he was a wise man, he was very wise, and they respected him. What do you think? He said, we don't need him. We don't need to bring him in to preach for us. And so they said, okay. 
So they tried another man out a week or two later, and he preached exactly the same sermon out of that same sermon book. And so they said, well, we just think we won't ask him, but we'll go ahead and ask him. And he said, hire him. And they said, well, no, wait a second. They preached almost the same sermon. He said, yeah, but the first guy told us we were going to hell, and he seemed to be glad for it. The other one told us we were going to hell, and he acted like he was sad we were going to hell. Uh, so the second one loved the people. He was sorry that they were in lost state. And I believe that's a good illustration of it. So we need to look at the lost souls and feel pity and mercy upon them, trying to get their souls saved. And we're not trying to save them so we can put a notch on our gun, say, look at all the people I converted, but we can say, look at the people who are Christians now. That's what we need to be looking at. All right, so much for that. that I'm preaching rather than teaching here. Sorry. But I think he... Quite all right. I think Appreciate he, it. I think he looks at prophecy, and it's the most important. He says, even if you have that straight, and all these other things in the right order, but you don't have love. King James wrongly has charity. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. Okay? You're not anything. And so he's now telling us that all of this stuff is empty if it's not done out of love. You could hate those that you prophesied to. Jonah seemed to do that. And it didn't hurt him. And please God, I think Jonah probably got straight in his mind. But God loved the Ninevites. He didn't love their actions, but he wanted them to be saved. And Jonah was sorry that they were not being destroyed. And they were a mean people. They were pretty mean. And you can you can read about what this what how they're described in the Bible and see it clearly. But the apostles know all mysteries. I love one of my favorite type movies or programs on TV is a mystery. I love mysteries. I love trying to sit back and figure out who done it and who did this. The apostles were given a stewardship and that's a, a steward is someone who's assigned over the property of someone. So given a stewardship of the mysteries. Here's our passage that we've already seen. And they're ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries. So this, these mysteries, in chapter two we see it as well. There, wisdom in the see God's wisdom in a mystery. Fifteen fifty one. Behold, I tell you a mystery. So he's revealing something that wasn't clear to people before this time. So if I understood all mysteries. And I don't want to understand the Bible, but if I'm not trying to understand it so I can use it for the benefit of lost souls and to take the saved and make them stronger, then my purpose is wrong. My purpose ought to be to help people go to heaven because I love their souls. All right, I'm, I'm, I've done enough of that. But knowing the Bible, what the Bible teaches is a good thing. But knowing in order to impress people is, is being puffed up because it's not accompanied by love. Willingness to sacrifice self for the good of others, that's where love comes in. Knowing what the Bible teaches in order to improve one's life, in order to edify others, in order to convert others is what knowledge should be about. To make me a better person so I can help others to go to heaven. And, and I think he's laying this out for them. So that he says here, in effect, even though, even though you have it straight, if you go back to chapter 12, 28, you, you get it straight, to, as I said, the importance, but you still have these as the most important. These, even prophecy is not more important than love. But a prophet who loves God and loves his neighbor is a great man or a great woman, a prophetess. And, and right here, when he says, have all faith, all the faith, it's the article. Right? Faith is put by way of metonymy for the effect, the ability to work miracles. And so a particular faith, see, a mountain moving faith, if we study it more carefully. 
And that may be a literal mountain moving. I believe that the man who had this power did have the power to speak to a mountain and it would be cast into the ocean. I think that could have happened. We don't know that it ever happened, but it certainly could have. God had the power to do it. We know that. So um, this uh, might just represent a great faith to be able to work miracles of all sorts. And Oros is, Oros is the word for mountain. Orogenesis is the word in the geology for the beginning of mountains. Yes. And I think this is obviously miraculous, and we have these passages on the side here, and where that same expression is used. Right. But if I do not have love, and again, I don't like the King James word charity there. I've laid that out for my reasons earlier. Having the ability given by God to work miracles doesn't elevate the person. It, it must be used in love. And I think if a man's a good preacher, uh, he, he should hide behind the cross. The old preacher used to, I used to hear them say, hide behind the cross. All right? I translate, and if I have the gift of prophecy, I put gift of in italics. And know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. It's not important. I've got my priorities wrong. Any questions? Okay. Chris, I believe if you would, could you read verse 13 and translate it for us, please? Yes, uh, verse 3. Kai uh, Aon, homiso. Panta ta, hupa uh, hupar konta mu kai ian parado to soma mu hina uh, uh, kanthe somai agape de me eko udin uh, o philomai. I have. And if I may give away all my possessions, and if, and if I may give away my body that I may be burned, but have not love, I have profited nothing. See, we go beyond it, even a person that would, and this would reach down to our time. We may not have the ability to prophesy, but one may have studied and be a good preacher or teacher. And if he is not doing it because of love of lost souls, He's got the wrong motive. But here he gives all of his property, all of his goods to feed the poor. And right here it's to feed, and the word the poor is in italics, you'll notice. In the King James American Standard, there's not a word for it. So I, I give all my, and to feed, if I give to feed all, and all that I have, and uh, of me. And I do not have, all right, if I give my body, the body of me, uh, to be burned. And our word cauterize comes from this, kakesoma, kakerizo, I believe that's what the word comes from. So if I do that, but it's not out of love, it's not going to profit me anything. I haven't gained anything, all right? So if I were to do that, we stole all my goods to feed the poor. The words to feed are derived from the verb here. So mezo, miso, so miso. It is the poor that need to be fed, not the wealthy. So that's why the word poor is put in there. Right? But we don't have love, and I think that's elliptical. Right? It's implied. I give all my goods to feed the poor but have not love. We give my body to be burned, but have not love. I think it's implied on all of them. This but have not love, I believe, goes with the feeding and the giving of the body both. It goes with both of them. And I, I do that, but don't have love. Okay. And I think Kai shows us that. He could have used day, delta, epsilon here. It would could be and. There's an, even another word for and. But Kai joins two things that are equal in rank. 
and equal to one another. So the feeding and the burning of the feeding of the of the persons of the poor in this case, and the burning of the body are both joined here. They're equal. He that believeth and is baptized, Kai, see. So they're both here. So both of them are done without love, see. I think that's implied by the Kai. I think the Kai gives us a good argument for joining both of them together. If you do either one of them without love or both of them without love, but I don't have love. Now, what about your your enemy? Uh, we don't have love. We're instructed to feed our enemies. This requires love on our part. That's tough. But if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. What are you going to do? You keep cold the fire on his head and make my shame of being your enemy. Probably their enemies would be those who are uh, attacking Christianity primarily. It's not someone that I was kind of mean to and he, he, he grew to hate me. Okay. It's somebody that's probably in the context, probably hating me because I'm a Christian, more than likely. So I'm, I'm defeating, okay. And we have the love for enemies required in Matthew 5, 43 through 48. And if I give my body to be burned, and I see the variant reading is called case of my the variant reading. Here's the manuscripts that read that way. All the Coptic. And it uh, it's the only difference is the omega and the omicron. And I can see how you can get either reading from it if a guy's up in, in the scriptorium where he's reading the text and the scribes are copying it from his reading. And the Omega and Omicron would almost sound the same. It could be very easily copied differently. But the variants are so minor in difference that it's not really a big deal. Okay. And they're really just variant spellings. That's all they are. They don't change the meaning. Variant spellings are the same word. English, I'll give you two variant spellings. First spelling is American spelling of vapor, and the second one is the English British spelling of vapor. They're the same word. Okay. So that's just a different variant spelling. It may be that the variant spelling was like British at some parts of where they spoke Greek, they spelled that word with a different little bit of variant spelling. That's entirely possible. And the scriptorium, whenever the fellow gets up and reads, and they've got four or five scraps listening to him, and they're copying what he reads. That was one of the things that was used for getting uh, several copies done. And when they read it, it depends on your background. You may see an Omega or an Omicron there. All right, I'll, I'll quit talking about that. I'm just not profited anything, not advantageous. And if I bestow all my goods to be the poor, and if I give all my, my give my body in order that it shall be burned, but have not love, it doesn't profit me anything. It does not profit me anything. All right. Any questions? Okay. Uh, James, could you take verse four? Yes, sir. Hey, agape, macro fume. Grace stuitai, he agape, u zeloi, he agape, u er, the root etai, u uh, fusiutai. And I translated that uh, love is patient and acts kindly. Love is not envious, love is not boastful or arrogant. Okay. Left up arrogant. Uh, this is the second argument. I think it's an a fortiori argument. And he's going to argue here that love is, the whole is greater than the part. So love suffers long, is kind, and envy if not, wrong if not, itself not puffed up. He's going to go on in the to our verse, following verse. 
I believe it's in our fourth hour. We'll see that when we get to the next verse. Let's look at these words. Notice the article is there, and he's talking about the love of this context that he's talking about. And he's really talking about, he's pointing back to the love he's been discussing in the prior verses, I believe, with the article. Notice the article is used every time right here. And this is agape love, we know what that means. And Macrothemia, macro, macros, put a sigma on it. I'll break it. Those put a sigma right here. It's a widespread, okay? Thumia is like your thymus gland. And so this is patience. And I'm a long suffering, see? I can go a long time and suffer with respect to people. This deals in my dealing with people. I'm so long suffering with them. And then because of that, even that, I'm kind to them. This word is only found here in the whole New Testament, the verb form. But the noun adjective form is found in all these passages. And the, a similar, this adjective is translated easy, better, kind, goodness, good, and gracious. And we have it translated other ways in the American Standard, King James. So, but the words, the word itself is only found here, that verb form of it. Paul makes some personal qualities in the form of contrast of attitude and external qualities. It begins with an attitude and then the external action follows from the attitude. If we don't adjust our attitudes, the action won't be right. Paul notes some personal qualities from a contrast of attitude and external qualities. He first notes negative qualities, things love does not do, so the love does not envy. Envy and jealousy are different. Envy is always bad. Jealousy can, can be good. God is jealous God, for example. We know that's not bad. The word say loo that's translated here is found in... Uh, it is a low o, translated envy, and it's sometimes translated with the idea of zeal, okay? And so it's translated moved with jealousy, uh, desire earnestly, envy it, jealous over, zealous, seek, may seek. See, of all the ways it's translated in the American Standard Version, here is how it's translated in the King James. So it's a, it's a word that has good and bad meanings depending on the context. Love doesn't bond itself, elevate itself above others. And so this is middle passive, a third person singular present, indicative middle passive. And it's running glorious. I see right here a repetition. Fair pair. Uta Uta. And I, I, when I see that, I almost think it's redundant, the uh, duplication, pi, pi, epsilon, rho, pi, epsilon, rho again. Some of the ones a little puffed up in themselves. And maybe go back to etymology of the word, it may, it may emphasize that, that boasting, you know, filled with pride and arrogance. And so, but it's not puffed up now. An animal, if this is a word for a bellows that you use like for your making a fire start and make it burn better. Push air into it and make it burn. And you can take a bell, set of bellows and blacksmiths wouldn't have bellows, for example. And so um, it's not puffed up. It's not swelled up. Like, we used to talk about swelled up like an old toad frog. When a toad is not a frog, but that's what we called it when I was a boy, toad frog. And they'll kind of swell up and make themselves look bigger than they are. And I watched two dogs get in a fight and their hair on the back will raise up and they they try to make themselves look bigger than they are. Cats will arch their back and they'll do that to look bigger. And so I think some of the Christians there in the Corinthians, that is, were puffed up. They thought possession by gifts made them superior. 
maybe God wanted them to have those gifts to help people rather than elevate them. them. That's what they should have been seeing. Love suffers long, is kind, not, in, not jealous, it doesn't bond itself, it's not puffed up. Now then, let's see in the next verse. I think, James, did you do the last one or did Chris? I did the last one. Okay, Chris, can you can you do verse five for us? Yes. Uh, ouk, uh, eske mone, ou, zete, ta, uh, yetes, uh, yetes, ou, uh, pero zunitai, ou, logis zete, to, kakon. Uh, I have here does not be, uh, behave uncom uncomely, uh, does not seek her own, is not easily provoked, does not keep records of evil or wrongs. Right. I remember all the things you did, and I'm going to keep an account of it. I'm going to keep track of all the things you did. Even if I forgave you, I'm going to keep track of it. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I'm just being facetious. All right. That's good, though. It's a good comment. Doesn't behave itself unseemly. Well, this is in a deformed way. This is something that's deformed. So the offer of primitive, it's not formed right. And this is, and so the, here's a bald man. He's deformed in a sense. He doesn't have hair, see? It's used that way there. So it's to act in some way. This It's, in, it's deformed in some way. So, it's not going to treat people wrong, see? It seeketh not, it doesn't seek out, and the Zetel is to seek in order to find. And it's looking for something you're trying to find. What are you trying to find? The Its own, and that's a reflexive pronoun. So you're trying to find stuff for yourself. Or are you trying to find something that elevates you? Bust the flesh, let's say, I probably laugh. Those are your three reasons for sin. And of course, ignorance can be another reason. But uh, so in this case, I think it's pride. And look how I'm elevated. Uh, love does not have a me first attitude or have my own way attitude, not self serving. And this provoking is interesting because it's to make sharper, sharpen, arouse to anger, it doesn't provoke or irritate. You don't do things to, to, to for the purpose of irritating people. Okay? This word is ambiguous. It can carry good or bad meanings. However, we can provoke to good. We can provoke to evil. I would provoke you to good. Uh, in Acts 17, 16, the provoking was good. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 here, it's provoking to evil. So the, the word has, I can provoke to evil or to good, depending upon how it's used. <clears throat> so that makes it ambiguous. You gotta look at the context, see how it's used. Doesn't take account. And this is to reckon or to calculate or make an account of, like a ledger. And you keep a list of stuff that people have done. It's found about 41 times in the Greek New Testament, this word is. And this is of the evil, kakos. And so this is an evil mode of thinking. It's the antithesis of agathos, which is good, morally good. And sometimes it's the, that frequently says the antithesis of kalos, which is good because it have all its parts here that it should have. Kakos, according to Trench, describes something that lacks the qualities, conditions, and make it worthy of its name. It just doesn't live up to its name. And let's think about this. These are supposed to be Christians and they're not living up to the name. See, it's not following through and being what they ought to be. And it's like garments that are tattered or mean or worn out. It used to be, if you had a hole in your pants, you were kind of ashamed of it. Now they buy them that way. I don't understand that, but okay, I'll get off that. 
does not behave itself unseemly, it does not seek its own things, I, I put it that way, is not provoked, does not keep an account of evil, and then I put note to the, in this, how this word is used in other passages, okay? Right. All right, now then let's look at another verse. Okay, verse six. I think we're back to James now. Yes, sir. Ukare epite adikia sunkare de te aletheia. And I translated that it does not rejoice because of unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Okay. I have seen people that have said, that guy's evil, I'm glad he got caught in his evil. Well, I wish he had been doing evil to get caught in it, okay? Maybe we ought to look at things differently. And sometimes we, uh, we don't want to rejo rejoice in unrighteousness or iniquity, the failure to do good. We don't want to rejoice and be happy in it. Uh, unrighteousness is a is a failure to be just or fair with people. But what does it rejoice in? Then, if it doesn't rejoice in that, it rejoices, it rejoices with. And so this is soon. Let me break it. It's the word soon, and this is from Kara Karao. And the gamma, let me break that and go back and do it over here. Be easier to do it over here. But you can see the Cairo, and that's to rejoice. And then that's soon the nu becomes a gamma for the key following it. That's soon Cairo, but it's from the Greek preposition soon, sigma, upsilon, nu. And so that's to rejoice with someone. And so I want to rejoice with what? The truth. Well, I don't know that we get the full thrust of that if we just take it literally. I think it's a metonymy where the truth, he's looking at the effects of the truth. We rejoice not just in the truth, but when the truth has sway over people's lives and they obey it. So I, I think probably that's what it's referring to. Yes, I believe we should rejoice in the in the truth of God's word, but I think we should rejoice even more so when the word God's word has a sway over and it causes people to obey God. So I take it that way. Rejoice when the truth has sway over men's lives. And it might have been a problem with some of because they're so wrapped up in elevating themselves, they're not thinking about advancing the truth. They're not concerned about people being saved or how it affected people. A righteous person has a double, unrighteous person has a double standard. The word just and the word righteous are the same word. Back in the Old Testament, you find very early just scales. And so we see just or righteous scales, you have the same standard for other people. And so I want to treat people in an, in an equal, equals, with an equal treatment of them as I would to myself or my family or others that I love very closely. I'll treat them with the same, same action. I won't elevate myself above other people. And let's look at verse seven. I think we got time to cover a few more verses, right? I think we're back to Chris. I think I'm losing track of who, who was last. Sorry. All right, uh, verse seven. Ponta stige uh, stige ponta pestue ponta uh, elpise ponta. Uh, I have uh, it is implied, bears all things, it's implied, believes all things, it implied here, hopes all things, it implied here, endures all things. And so the it is back here to love, isn't it? Truth or the love of the, the love that he's talking about. I think he's talking about that. You agree? Yes. 
love will cause us to bear all things. See, that's the effect. And uh, so this is uh, like covering. Now, we can cover sin in a scriptural sense or put a roof over it. See, this is the word from a roof, a thatched roof, see, a protective covering. So what do I do? I want to try to protect my brother to help him to get away from sin to cover his sin. Now, there's two kinds of senses which sin can be covered. We go back to Proverbs, and I have it on the screen here, Proverbs 10, 12, and 17, 9. And uh, this is how sin is covered. And there's a good way of covering it, there's a bad way of covering it. We don't look at both of them. Hatred, sheriff of strife, but love covereth all transgressions. He's going to cover them. Well, we don't know how it covers them. We'll see here farther. He that covereth transgressions, he goes love it. He that harpeth on the matter, separateth his friend. So right here, he's harping on the matter as he keeps bringing it up. Now, if a person has been forgiven, we need to let it go. He need to bring it up again. And for First Peter four eight, you know, to harp on it, say, First uh, Peter four eight, above all things, being fervent in love among yourself, for love covers the multitude of sins. James five nineteen tells us how, and so I think we, James is kind of summing it up for us. My brother, if you run your air from the truth, one convert him, gets him back. Say, here's a brother that's aired, and I'm going to try to retrieve his soul. Let him know that he that converteth an error, a sinner from the error of his way shall save a multitude of souls, save a soul death, cover a multitude of sins. So that's covering sin by converting the person, getting converted back to serving God. There's maybe a subtlety to it, but in the in the Old Testament, they would put blood on the mercy seat and cover it up so that the sin could not be seen. So that's how sin was covered back then. It was it was it was forgiven by God. And there might be a, a sense in which he's referring to that very thing that if God placed the high priest put the blood on the mercy seat to cover the sin then if I'm going to cover someone's sins, I need to hide it. So I'm, I'm not bringing it up anymore. I let it go. And we're helping that person to get his sin covered by the blood of Christ. And so there might be that that's what he's referring to. I'm not certain about that. But I think that's a possibility. When we look at it in James 5 and some of these other passages, we want to put them all together. All right. Any comments? Yeah, I would, uh, on atonement, I absolutely agree that has to do with the covering of sin, especially the way the word is used. I believe it's kapar in uh, Hebrew, and there's five or six different ways it's translated, maybe more. But in each case, the root idea behind it is the covering. The big difference between that and the New Testament is that Jesus' blood removed sin. It would no longer need to be covered, but removed. and Praise God that Jesus came and did that. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Well, you got a good point there. I have to rethink my thinking on that matter. Okay. He still talks about covering sin. And you're, you're saying it's the covering is the means of converting the sin. Okay. In James 5 and 1 Peter 4. Okay. All right. I'll study on that some more. I think you got a good point. Chris, you got anything you want to add there? No, no, I, I, I like the, the views there. I, I, you know, James has uh, got a good point there too. I also like the idea of the roof over our sins. I've heard it explained that, like that quite a bit as well. And it's the word for roof, roof up here in our, in our text. Uh, there's an improper covering of sin in Proverbs 28 to 13. And it may not be referring to the high priest action with these passages in Proverbs, okay? Uh, but he's saying that in this case, he doesn't confess his sin. See, Proverbs 28, 13. He that covers his transgression shall not prosper, but, notice contrast, 
whoso confesses and forsaketh him shall obtain mercy. So the man who covers his sins, he doesn't confess it and doesn't forsake it. I think in that context, that, that's in a bad sense right there. And if we just hide our sins and don't don't uh, don't get it taken care of and repented of and confessing it, we don't get it right. Well, incidentally, I would reference uh, Hebrew nine with my comments. Okay, Hebrews chapter nine. Yes, sir. Okay, he believeth all things. Now, see, I had one fellow say, "Well, you got to just believe whatever I say," and I said, "No, no, no." Believe us all things. It's faith based upon evidence. And so Jesus rebuked his disciples for not believing what the prophets had written, Luke 24, 25. But faith, the noun form of this word, pistuo, for believe, is based on evidence, Hebrews 11, 1. Right? I like the King James and the American Standard together in Hebrews 11, a faith assurance of things hoped for. King James, the faith is a substance. There's substance to it. And Greg Standard says a conviction of things not seen. King James says evidence of things not seen. You're convicted based upon evidence, see? The word all here, perhaps, is most more difficult to define. We know that faith is based on evidence. Therefore, Paul's not saying that love is gullible. There seem to be two different possible explanations for the word all. I'll give about, about two explanations, or it all may be contemplated the belief of all the scriptures, as we see in Luke 24, 25. The word all might be contemplated the belief in things that people tell you, things that have credible evidence might be from the context of bearing all things. For example, we believe when a person tells us he's repented. We see this in Luke 17. We just take his word for it, and if he's lying, he'll have to deal with God. He hides it from us. But I'm going to forgive him if he tells me he's repented. And go on and, and just let it go. I won't keep a record of it. So it, it hope us all things. And again, I think the all things, and it probably is all things that are good, not evil. Of course, we don't hope for evil. And we see this in Romans 8, 24 and 25. And things that God has promised to the faithful, that, that may be the hope he's talking about. Or we may hope for good in others. We may hope that they obey the gospel. But hope usually entails a reason to expect something. And it endures all things. And this may be enduring persecution here. The Bomonao, the Bomeno, I has uh, translated endureth and endure tarried right here patiently in the King James Version. It probably refers to enduring hardships for the cause of Christ, most likely. But again, during the hardships, such as giving your body to be burned and so forth, if it doesn't have love, he's already shown us that it's not going to help. We have two words in this context. We have uh, Microthemia and hupomone, and both of them used in this context. And microthemia is patience with people. Hupomone, the word that's found here, and that uh, bears all things, is uh, endures and enduring all things. Enduring here, that's dealing with things. One of them is patience with persons rather than just patience with respect to things happening right my car breaks down and i need to be patient with it it's a thing the weather is not conducive that bad weather my house was hit by a tornado in 2003 and i lost some things that i had fortunately my my library wasn't that wasn't damaged <laughs> yeah parts of the house, but didn't get my library. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Found that be interesting. But uh, whatever the case, I did lose some things, and you can't get mad at God. Stuff happens. Okay. And so that's enduring all things. 
I think Paul's argument is that the whole is greater than the part. So all the scriptures hang on the commandment to love both God and our neighbor, as we see in Matthew 22, Mark 12, uh, and Luke 10, and Romans 13. These passages cited right here in the middle of the screen. And I've, and I've put the text of Matthew 22, 36 through 40 in here. The sum or whole of the will of God is to love God and to love our neighbor. And then these are aspects of love. I don't think this is the whole or entirety of love itself. I think he's giving us here the aspects that they were short in, they fell short in. And he's trying to get them to get it right. Yes, this makes a very good sermon on love, but we must not think that this is all there is to love. These are parts of love. But the entirety of love is to obey the whole will of God. The sum or whole of the will of God is to love God and love our neighbor. That's what Jesus said. Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? The law of Moses. And he said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. Then when Jesus went ahead and answered another one, he says, the second like unto it is this. So here's the second commandment, second greatest, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And he says, on these two commandments, the whole law hangeth in the prophets, the entirety of God's word hangs on these two commandments. All, these, all of the law of God is a commentary on these two commandments. And I believe that's true. <clears throat> and so the Corinthians had particular problems and he's addressing them. And yes, this makes a wonderful sermon on love, but there's more to love than just this. This is what they had problems with. And we go to the rest of the scriptures and take the entirety of God. And Paul's going to develop this further into chapter 14. The gifts were designed to edify, to, not to elevate the one who possessed the gift. And when you see the purpose of each gift and the unity in the body that it should have brought from chapter 12, will grow in love for both God and our fellow man. We need, we need to say, what can my actions do to help people grow and to become better servants of the Lord, including myself? Right? to end. I think it would be good to end right here. Do you have questions? All right, let me say this. This is your third argument that faith, hope, and love abide longer than the miraculous gifts. And so this is another a fortiori argument for, for a greater cause. So he's going to make that argument. And that will get us into verse 8 and following, 8 through 13, which we should finish next week. Any questions? We get into the word here in this, that which is perfect. If you have my volume 2 on the work of the Holy Spirit, I'd devote a whole chapter to this. And, of course, I would encourage you to study it on your own before you, before you uh, read my book, okay? And uh, so that I won't corrupt your mind in your thinking or or bias you one way or the other, okay? So try to study it on your own and then you can read what I've written, okay? Do that after you study it on your own. All right, any questions? All right, so we're going to get out.